This morning, during Sunday school, I asked a bunch of our youth to think, what would it be like if our early presidents of this country had chosen a denomination like, you know, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, whatever, and declared that all U.S. citizens have to belong to that denomination. Everyone would have to join that denomination whether they want to or not. They would have to be baptized into that church. And anyone who wanted to be part of another denomination would be accused of being disloyal to their country. And if you persisted in it, the police would knock on your door and say, you are undermining our government. You need to stop. And if you didn't, you could be executed for treason. So this year, 2022, our theme is telling our story. And I want us this morning to look at the story of the Mennonite church's beginning. And when the Mennonite church began, there was no freedom of religion. Rather than separation of church and state, each nation had a state church to which all in that nation had to belong. If the king or duke was Catholic, everybody in that area was Catholic. If they were Lutheran, then you were Lutheran. As an infant, you would be baptized, and now you were part of that church. In fact, our Mennonite churches, founding fathers and mothers, began the first free church in the Western world. By free church, I mean voluntarily chosen uh, rather than being forced to, to join it by the state. Here's a, a diagram, a picture giving sort of the family tree of the different churches. You can see the Orthodox Church sort of continues the main sweep and there was the Roman Catholic Church that broke off that. Uh, around the year 1000 and then in the beginning of the 1500s the Reformation and a bunch of other churches break off the Catholic Church. Here's our branch, the Anabaptists from which came the, the Mennonites and the Baptists and the Amish. At the point where we started every church was a state church except us. Not only the Catholics were a state church, but the Protestant reformers were also, um, they, they established their own uh, state church. I'm going to tell this morning the story of one of the first generation of Anabaptist leaders. His name is Pilgrim Marpeck. You can see his dates there. Virtually no one knew about him uh, 200 years after his death, 300 years after his death. But then in the last century, as more people were pouring over the archives of different cities, um, his writings started coming to light. And we now have far more words that Pilgrim Marpeck wrote than from any other Anabaptist leader. And currently, there are more books being published about him than any other Anabaptist leader. Pilgrim was born in the Tyrol. Which is, as you can see, square in the middle of the Alps. So that part of Austria um, has more of the Alps than what Switzerland does. It's 
It's a beautiful place with steep hillsides, mountains, thick forests, uh, and many mines. The mountains of the Tyrol were rich in silver, which was the major form of currency in Europe at that time, and 80% of Europe's silver came from the Tyrol. The capital is Innsbruck. You've heard of that town, or many of you have heard of that city. It means bridge on the Inn River. Pilgrim was born in a small city on the Inn River called Rattenburg. His parents owned some of the silver mines. His father was a district magistrate, uh, also on the Rattenburg City Council, also served as the mayor. Pilgrim followed his father on the city council when he was 25. Two years later, he was elected the mayor of Rottenburg. But here's the big one. At age 30, he was appointed by Archduke Ferdinand of Austria to be a mining magistrate. Uh, one thing I read said there was only five mining magistrates in, in all of Europe at that time. This was one of the most demanding and, and responsible positions in the Tyrol. Uh, he would be the one that would lease new mining strips or pits in that region, administer the laws regulating mining, settle legal controversies um, related to those laws. In addition, Pilgrim was helping to run his family's mines, overseeing the day-to-day -day operations, supervising the labor. Any worker with a complaint would come to Pilgrim. Uh, Pilgrim was overseeing any improvements that needed to be made. He became an ace engineer. Pilgrim became mining magistrate at age 30. And he became 30 in 1525. <clears throat> Anyone know what happened in Zurich, Switzerland? You can see it up there. Um, <clears throat> in 1525. <laughs> I see some smiles from some of the youth. Um, <clears throat> one evening in January 1525, a Bible study group met. They had all been baptized as infants into this state church. That evening, they chose to be rebaptized as believers. They, along with their pastor, who they were studying the Bible with, had come to see that in the Bible, baptism marks a choice to follow Jesus' teachings and Jesus' way. Infants can't choose. Infants can't believe. So they were moving toward believer's baptism and wanting to leave infant baptism behind. But the Zurich City Council that January 1525 had just forbade anything but infant baptism. And the pastor was saying, okay, let's... Let's go with the church council on this. Unity as a city is important. But this group of students, maybe you want to think of them as campus radicals, whatever. They said, but the Bible, not the council, is our authority when it comes to matters of faith like baptism. Because they were rebaptized, they were branded as Anabaptists. Uh, Anna is the Latin prefix for again. Uh, basically, Anabaptist means rebaptizers. They had to leave Zurich, but everywhere they went, they preached and they baptized, sending out more preachers. By the next year, 1526, the movement had reached the Tyrol. 
Remember Pilgrim's position. He worked closely with miners. He would hear their complaints to learn what needed improving. He would listen to hear what was going on in the mine. And it seems that he was also hearing some of the stirrings of this Anabaptism. A year later, an Anabaptist evangelist came to Rottenburg. Here's the city of Rottenburg today. His name was Leonhard Scheimer, and his dates are there. Notice uh, the square tower there in the bottom left. Uh, that's part of the old castle of Rottenburg. Scheimer had been baptized that May, May 1527. In August, just a few months later, he and 60 other Anabaptist leaders, evangelists, met to come to agreement on their teaching. For instance, most of them agreed on no military service because they're following Jesus who called them to love their enemies. So that was August. In September, Scheimer went to Rattenburg. By October, so this is within six months of him being baptized, being becoming an Anabaptist, he had preached in 28 cities, winning more than 200 converts to Anabaptism. How do we know that? because a few weeks after he arrived in Rattenburg, Scheimer was arrested, and that was part of what was said at his trial. About that same time, Pilgrim received an order from Innsbruck. You, as the mining magistrate, are to apprehend and punish any Anabaptists. Pilgrim wrote back, I'm not gonna do that. That's not part of my job description. Was there something going on in his conversations with the miners? Was he hearing some preaching himself? Were his sympathies aligning with the Anabaptists? Then Ferdinand himself sent a letter directly to Pilgrim demanding that he arrest the Anabaptists. And Pilgrim replied with something vague. And Ferdinand thought, okay, he's going to do it. Then, not 200 yards from Pilgrim's house, in January 1528, Scheimer was executed at the castle above Rattenburg. Here's a picture, and to help you situate it, there's that, there's that square tower. He was decapitated, and his body then was burned. That gathering of 20 of 60 Anabaptist leaders the previous August, you remember that? Historians call it the Martyrs Synod because virtually all the participants were killed for their faith within months, definitely years. Why were the governments of Europe so frightened by the Anabaptists? Well, for a thousand years, there was only one state church in every political territory, and the idea of having more than one church seemed like a threat to the unity of the state and the security of the state and to the social peace. What happened to Pilgrim? Pilgrim clearly had chosen with the Anabaptists. Within days after Scheimer's death, Pilgrim resigned his job and days later, he and his wife, Anna, were gone. They had fled. Two months later, public records show Pilgrim and Anna showing up in the city of Strasbourg, uh, which is on the Rhine River, which separates France from Germany. Through history, Strasbourg sometimes was part of France, sometimes was part of Germany. But in this day, Pilgrim's Day, it was its own imperial free city. So 
It was not under any other government. It was its own government. And Strasbourg was more tolerant than most of the places. Uh, in the early days of the Anabaptist movements, many Anabaptists found shelter there. It's not like Strasbourg liked the Anabaptists. Uh, the idea of baptism outside of the state church sounded pretty dangerous, radical, and the Anabaptist rejection of war seemed to mean, hey, these people won't protect our city if we get attacked. But the leaders of Strasbourg talked with them and learned about this new movement. It was only a couple years old, debated with them. Pilgrim demonstrated very soon the competence that he had shown in the Tyrol. He was hired as city engineer of Strasbourg. He reported directly to the city council of Strasbourg. He built a water system for the city, including channels for floating wood through the surrounding valley, valleys, helping Strasbourg, which lacked wood, get access to the forests around it. A canal for floating logs that he constructed still exists in Strasbourg today. So Pilgrim and Anna could have entered the elite circles of Strasbourg. But what did they do? Every employee of the city was required to join a guild. Pilgrim joined the poorest guild, the guild of the wagoners and gardeners. And joined and then led one of the despised Anabaptist congregations. The city's leading reform preacher, Martin Busser, was drawn to Pilgrim, thought highly of him as a person, engaged him in a series of intense but respectful debates. Busser was saying, your teaching against infant baptism breaks the unity of church and state. Pilgrim spoke passionately for the separation of church and state and called for the state not to coerce people in matters of faith. In the end, the city council in early 1532, Pilgrim had been in the city four years, banished him, albeit very unenthusiastically. Uh, they preferred to have him stay. Uh, the, the state or the, the city ruling on this has paragraphs of good things about him. They really liked him, but he could only stay if he gave up teaching against infant baptism and against military service to protect the city. They liked him so much that he asked, could I have a few weeks to sell my property and get my affairs in order? And they granted him it. And at the end of those few weeks, they granted him another and then another. <laughs> Then he and Anna left Strasbourg. The next 12 years, we don't know much about Pilgrim and Anna's life, which is actually a good thing. Why is that? <laughs> because we usually know about Anabaptists when they were caught and put on trial or put in jail or executed. We do know that he was a city engineer for a year or two of one Swiss city named St. Gallen. So that was 12 years, 1532 to 1544. The last 12 years of his life, Pilgrim was in the city of Augsburg. Uh, in Germany today. That's the part of Germany we know as Bavaria, up against the Alps. Augsburg was one of the most important and wealthiest cities of that time. And it was a Protestant city, sort of a Protestant island in the midst of a Catholic sea. And it was intolerant of anyone who advocated for Catholicism or advocated for a free church. 
In the 1540s, Augsburg had only one small underground Anabaptist congregation. So why would Pilgrim and Anna move there? Well, in 1544, he applied for the position of Augsburg's water engineer. The director of water systems and wood supply. That role in Augsburg was extremely important. It was a high position. Uh, Augsburg had become wealthy because it was at the juncture of several large rivers. By 300 years ago, mills had begun to be built along the rivers. By now, Augsburg had a severe wood shortage which led the city fathers to hire Pilgrim, who was good at building those uh, water flumes that would allow logs to be floated into the, into the area. They hired him on the condition that he would not engage in open church work. His services were evidently in great demand for, although the city again and again issued reprimands and warnings he continued his activities as a pastor and writer and prominent leader among the Anabaptists until his death. Tom Finger, uh, who is, I would say, today's most important Mennonite theologian, he's definitely the only Mennonite theologian today who has written a multi-volume systematic theology. He says that Pilgrim is the most important theologian of the early Anabaptists. Pilgrim's writing shows a good mind and a heart. It's full of beautiful thoughts. He talks about the word of God going forth and converting people. He talks about the father kissing the hearts of the faithful and bringing them new life. He has he has this tremendous sense of God's glory and majesty, and yet, Jesus descended, Pilgrim would say, from so far above us, from such glory that we can't even imagine, to take on our flesh and become one of us, and even identify with us who are in the worst kind of situations, and to die the worst death in his society. And we also should never be too high, too lofty to associate with the lowly. Above all, Tom Finger says, Pilgrim sought balance among Anabaptist emphases. Um, some Anabaptists were mystics, and Pilgrim would nurture, did all that he could to nurture a rich inner mystical faith, but he also insisted that that should manifest itself in everyday life. It should change how you live, not just be something in your mind and in your spirit. And it needed to be sustained through your involvement with the church and the sacraments. Another way that Pilgrim sought balance. Uh, he stressed the disciplined life, but he opposed an overly strict discipline, which was a common Anabaptist error. He extolled a, a virtue seldom prioritized by other Anabaptists, patience. That was a quote from Finger. Uh, yes, Pilgrim said, we must judge the fruits of church members' lives but too often we judge by the blossoms and leaves. We make a hasty judgment. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus said to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. In the opening days of the Reformation, Jesus chose Pilgrim Marpeck called to him, and Pilgrim said yes, though it cost him greatly, especially what he left behind in Rottenburg, an estate 
houses worth 3,500 guilders, um, which uh, as a mining magistrate, um, it's like six times more than what he earned a year as a mining magistrate. He also had to leave behind his children. He and Anna left because if he traveled with them, it would slow him down. But even more, if he was captured and he had every reason to think that he would, then what would happen to his children? So he left them there in Rottenburg where he knew they would be with people he loved and trusted. Left so much, he left so much as he had to leave Strasbourg as well. But instead he went out in faithfulness and Christ brought beautiful fruit through him Part of that fruit was that Anabaptism survived and thrived. Uh, new movements draw lots of hotheads, lots of extremists, and Anabaptism did. And Pilgrim gave much balance, much stability, much maturity to this new movement. He also helped. Part of the fruit of Pilgrim's life was that he helped to move the world toward freedom of religion. Because he wanted to be free to obey what Jesus and the Bible called him to do. It's not like he sat down and sort of invented this concept of freedom of religion and separation of church and state. No, he just wanted to practice what scripture taught, what Jesus called him to do. He wanted to be free to do that. And that, that led to the sense of a call for freedom of religion and separation of church and state. Jesus told his disciples, verse 17, this is my command, love each other. And Pilgrim loved those miners. He loved those wagoneers and gardeners. Following Jesus, Pilgrim was never too high, never too lofty to associate with the lowly. He loved all of his congregations. He loved those Protestant reformers that he dialogued with. They actually had a respectful dialogue. The transcript is something that was saved in the city archives. He loved the people of Strasbourg and Augsburg. Uh, meeting their need for water and wood and giving their economy a boost. Jesus also had comfort for a pilgrim in his suffering, in his persecution. If the world hates me, John 15, 18, keep in mind it hated, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The world may condemn us. In some ways, we Jesus followers are becoming more unpopular, it seems, each year in our society. But we face nothing compared to what Pilgrim faced. Let's, like pilgrim and like Jesus called to these disciples, not focus on the world, but focus on Jesus who has chosen us. Let's please him. Nothing else matters.